everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Here is your Collider Movie Talk gang. First up, senior producer, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and I'm, I'm ready to call it. Hmm. This is going to be the first year in like five years I have resisted and not gotten the nerd flu from Comic-Con. I wanted to give it a couple of days to make sure nothing kicked in, but I survived it this year. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm really happy. Did the 2000 election teach you nothing? You cannot call something this early. (laughs) If you were in Canada, here in the United States, we had a huge debate because we called something too early. I am the Fox News of nerd flu. I'm calling it right now. No lozenges. No lozenges. (laughs) Also here, writer-director John Schnepp. And I, I as well, uh, only had uh, p- a partial sickness on Saturday. You had like the nerd sniffles. Yeah, nerd sniffles. I rested on Saturday, got better, and it, you know, no lasting nerd flu, no nerd con crud, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. Everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> And Mark Ellis. I'm calling out the nerd flu. You know where I live. Come on, bring it on. I've never got the nerd flu, never will get the nerd flu. That's pretty, <laughs> hey, I'd be afraid, Ellis. That's pretty, you know. Mm-mm. All right, the new Fantastic Four film opens in just a few weeks on August 7th, and many fans online have begun to speculate about what we may see in the post credit scene. However, at this past week's Comic-Con in San Diego, actor Jamie Bell, who plays Ben Grimm, a.k.a. The Thing, said the following, No, we don't have a post credit scene. It does leave the door wide open for a lot of different movies. I think this movie really focuses on the origins of each character individually, how they get their powers, how they learn to deal with them, how they learn to harness them, That's kind of where the movie ends. But then there's so much more to go from there. It really leaves the door open. John, do you believe that there won't be an end credit scene for Fantastic Four? And if so, do you agree with that move? Yes, I do. I do believe that there won't be a post credit scene. And I agree with the move, oddly enough. This isn't like the Marvel Cinematic Universe where, okay, they've been up and running and operational now for years and years and years and years. And let's look back to that first Iron Man post-credit scene. Okay, Nick Fury just shows up and mentions Avengers. That post-credit scene did not corner Marvel or Kevin Feige in any creative direction at all, except that now you're kind of stuck with having to use Samuel L. Jackson, which they had fully intended to use anyway. With Fantastic Four, this is their first movie. They've already announced the release date for the second one, but why creatively tie your hands now? Why set up a post credit scene now that sets something up specifically, unless you do what Avengers did, what you did in Iron Man 1 with just something very vague, but why paint yourself into a corner now when you still got a few months that you can change the script, do different things, you've still got some time, why paint yourself into a corner now? So yeah, I do believe there will be no post credit scene, and... I would have been totally happy and fine with it if they did have a post credit scene, but I also think it's probably a pretty, you know, wise move, a pretty shrewd move at this point to not have one in it and just see how things go. So that's how I see it. Anyway, Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, once again, it's Fox. Marvel's the ones who, the the company that's been doing these post credit scenes, and then some other companies kind of jumped on the bandwagon. But I don't necessarily see them having to, to do one. If they did one, it would be cool, but I don't need one. So. See, I don't trust actors as much as I trust directors when they say there isn't going to be a post credit scene, so I'm not 100% sure that we won't see one. As a fan, I'd love to see one that hints at either the Silver Surfer or X-Men or some sort of tie-in, but if they're not ready to make that leap, if they don't have that, whether it's studio rights or it's we just don't know which direction we want to take this story at, then you should not put the cart in front of the horse. Like The worst thing you could do is hint at a character and then say, oh, well, no, we either don't have the rights to that character anymore or we don't really want to go in that direction anymore or this one didn't test well so it's a smart safe move to not have a post credit scene unless you're sure you're going that way remember we talked about this months ago that they might want to do some sort of crossover in the future with the fantastic four and x-men who both right, right now are still at fox and fox the x-men by the way had a sweet post credit scene in the wolverine that was hinting at oh, X-Men right. Days yes, of Future Very good one. So, yeah. but, but that's all in the same universe. Yeah. So if you have like a Silver Surfer pop in or somebody else from the Fantastic Four universe already, then that is something I could, I could rationalize more. But 
I hope that there's some sort of hint within the movie to a bigger universe than just these characters, because I think that's neat. Ant-Man executed that brilliantly, as most of you guys are going to see this weekend. Yes, so, it did. Um, so we'll see. It's not going to break my heart either way, but now as a fan, I'm totally on the side of like, yeah, I kind of like both credit scenes, so it'd be it'd be kind of cool to see one, but I understand not having one. Plus, the Fantastic Four have like the a re- incredible rogues gallery. They could have the red ghost, like this weird, weird old man with three <laughs> strange apes. He's experimenting on them. You know, it's like, yeah. you would, no one would know what that is, you know? You know, the funny thing, too, is is that the post credit scene is, is supposed to just be this extra little bonus, right? Now, we as film fans, we've morphed it into we are owed a post credit scene. Right. So now, when there is a, before it was when there was a post credit scene, it's like, hey, 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 this is news. There's a post credit scene in the movie. Right. But now it's like, if there's not a post credit scene, why is there no post credit <laughs> scene? That's like cuz movies aren't supposed to have post credit scenes. They're bonuses, but but we are evolving. Now we've kind of come to expect them. But I think it's cool that for the first one out, they go without. All right, what's like, you made me sit through all those credits for nothing. Yeah, yeah we like, we <laughs> did not ask you to sit through anything. All right, what's next? The first trailer for the new David O. Russell film, Joy, has hit the web. The film stars Russell's Silver Linings playbooks cast of Jennifer Lawrence, Bradley Cooper, and Robert De Niro, and is described as follows. Joy is the story of a family across four generations and the woman who rises to become founder and matriarch of a powerful family business dynasty. The story is inspired by the life and times of inventor-entrepreneur Joy Mangano, creator of, in- creator of ingenious designs with over $1 billion in sales, as well as inspired by elements from the lives of other historic business pioneers. Schnepp, what did you think of the trailer for Joy? I loved it. It definitely had that uh, a Russell flavor to it. It had it just uh, it was great to see all those cast members from uh, Silver Linings Playbook back in, in, together again. And uh, I'm really intrigued. I mean, I, I like the way he puts together his trailers because it doesn't tell you too much about the movie, but it gives you just enough where you're like, I cannot wait to see this. So I cannot wait to see this film. So 100%. I cannot wait to see this film, but the trailer did literally nothing for me. Like I, it, because the the description that Sinead just wrote, just read to us, is like, okay, it's got David O. Russell. It's got the same stars from Silver Linings Playbook. It's this cool story about this entrepreneur uh, named Joy. The movie's called Joy. That's all I needed to know. And then you just show me all these random scenes, and it's just like it didn't look like anything. I, I didn't get anything out of it. I understand nothing about the story. I just know the famous people that are going to be on screen in this movie. I'm not a huge fan of that Rolling Stones song. You can't always get what you want. I understand it's a great I think, tune. I it think therein lies the right. hatred, Ellis, is, <laughs> is just, the song. Because they the trailer for me, it, it says, here's what your life is supposed to be. It's like a storybook. And then here's what your life really is, a series of strange, horrible things happening. And that's what I got out of it. Yeah, I, I didn't get that out of it. But oh, maybe I was just, just watching. Just that hating. Maybe watching on your phone isn't the best way to watch a trailer. <laughs> but I just didn't care about the trailer. I care about the movie, not the trailer. See, this trailer is a perfect example of this phenomenon. A number of years ago, um, so, there was a trailer came out, and I can't remember what the movie was for, and everybody raved about it. And I remember somebody said to me once, okay, John, watch that trailer again. But at the end, instead of the words, and I can't remember who the director was, but it was a very respected director. At the end of the trailer, instead of the words directed by whatever came up, what if it said directed by Michael Bay? Would you still see, would you still see the trailer the same way? And I went, you know what? I looked at it again. I probably wouldn't. I, I would probably be seeing the Bayisms in it, and I'd be complaining about it. And I think a lot of people would complain about. It. This is one of those types of trailers where, if the opening thing was, um, you, know, you know, directed by M. Shamhammer, you know, that M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> came up, and then I saw that trailer, what I would be seeing is this is just a random you know, sequence of graphics and images being thrown up with an odd selection of a soundtrack. And this was nonsense. But because it's David O. Russell, and it because it's this cast, I expect a certain level of depth. So when I look at the trailer, I see that depth. So my experience watching the trailer, having already known it was David O. Russell. And look, David O. Russell, by the way, is one of the most underrated directors going right now. We never talk, when, whenever conversations come up about who are some of the best directors working today, the name David O. Russell does not come up. But all this guy does is crank out excellence. Every single film he does cranks out excellence with multiple Academy Award nominations for him and his actors that he directs. It's incredible. So knowing that, I watched that trailer and I saw what you pointed out, which I thought was perfect. It sets up 
this thing about there's a fairy tale about what life is supposed to be and then the harsh realities of what that life is all coming in and intertwining. And I thought on that level it was great, but I fully admit, if that said, brought to you by Michael Bay at the beginning, I would have seen random images with bad song selection. I, I, have, to, I have to argue that point. Look, I'm saying for me. No, but I, I, it's, a, it's a great thing, a great analogy, but why I liked it specifically is because I could see Russell's shot selections. I, he's, yeah. he's a director that I've seen enough of his films now that I'm used to like, oh, that's a tracking shot. That's the way he does a tracking shot. It's different than the way Martin Scorsese does a tracking shot. Directors all have different subtleties, and the shot selections vary in from that trailer. Not only are very similar to the shot selections from uh, Silver Linings Playbook, but a lot of his other films. So, I mean, if you put M, M. Night Shyamalan's name up there and you see, sh saw those same images, not only would it be like, wow, that's going to be an amazing film. It's a comeback for M. Night. I would also say it looks like he's taking some uh, tips off of some of these other directors because his style's changed. Because he doesn't, M. Night doesn't do shots like that. I mean, I'm just saying, like, from someone who, like, looks specifically at composition and shots, I could tell different directors. So if Michael Bay's name was on there, I'd be like, wow, it's not a Michael Bay film <laughs> at all. Yeah, well, and I would, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you see that because I, I would, okay. I'm, I'm dumb. I saw it the other way. Uh, let me just, quick question though. Favorite David O. Russell film? Uh, Three Kings. Mm, I'd probably go The Fighter. Uh, if I had to on the top of my head, um, because that, that movie encompassed everything that, that guy's really good at. American Hustle, I thought it was really good, but I think some people were disappointed by it. I don't know that it was an Academy Award level film. Silver Linings Playbook is also way up there for me, too. Right. So uh, I hope this movie's good. I just maybe this trailer was like a magic eye painting that you used to see at the mall. I just need to stare <laughs> at it for longer, and this brilliant piece of art's going to come out. But I don't like that Rolling Stones song. Sorry. Uh, the. Uh I think I Heart Huckabees is a very underrated oh, film. I Heart Huckabees is amazing. But I also got to go with you. I go with The Fighter. I love The Fighter. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, sinead has got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? As most of you know, the Andrew Garfield Amazing Spider-Man franchise is now over, with Sony Pictures rebooting the character for his own new franchise, as well as appearances in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, actor Dennis Leary, who played Captain George Stacy in the series, was interviewed by IGN at San Diego Comic-Con and revealed a little bit about the possible future plans for the now-departed series. Leary said the following, I was disappointed because I'm totally selfish and greedy. I came back briefly in 2 and possibly in The Amazing Spider-Man 3. There was this idea at one point that Spider-Man would be able to take this formula and regenerate the people in his life that had died. So there was this discussion that Captain Stacy would come back even bigger in episode three. So I was like, let's go. Mark, do you buy or sell this potential plot direction for The Amazing Spider-Man 3? I say this as the biggest fan that Pet Cemetery ever had. <laughs> I totally sell this premise. I am very happy this is not the direction they took it in because as somebody who was admittedly entertained by The Amazing Spider-Man 2, it's not a great film, but I shoved some popcorn in my face and had some fun watching the stuff on screen. This is not the way to go. With the way that franchise was going, if you put this reanimated storyline into it, it just gets even messier and it just sounds stupid to me. Like, really, we're gonna now we're gonna bring back people from the dead, and then maybe we can bring his daughter back from the dead too. I don't know, but it just I, I don't I, we don't need zombies in this world. I'm sure it happened in the comic books at some point. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you decide to take from the comic book lore and make into a feature film that you only get to do one every three years. That is the wrong story to go with. I'm sorry. All I could think about when I read these comments was the Marvel zombies. Right. right. That, that's that's right. all I could think about was Marvel right. Zombies. And look, you're you're look, I'm also one of the people I enjoyed the Amazing Spider Man too, but it was a I'm in agreement with everybody else that it was a massive drop off from the first Amazing Spider Man. And this would have just continued the downward spiral, <laughs> bringing back the dead. So okay, so he'll bring back Uncle Ben. He'll bring back right. us both both the <laughs> Stacys. He'll <laughs> he'll bring back, I don't know, whoever else died in, in these franchises. Now where it could have been interesting and bold filmmaking, maybe if they wanted to be experimental, if they did that, but it did become like, there is a theme in the Spider-Man films where tragic things come from scientists messing with things they shouldn't mess with. That's been a running theme through both the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films and the Mark Webb Spider-Man films. So if 
Peter Parker then got caught up in that, tried that, and all of a sudden the Stacys and Uncle Ben start turning bad and they're zombies and they're killing other people, whatever, and now in some tragic, dramatic end, Peter's got to kill Uncle Ben again. I, even that doesn't work. I'm trying to make something up and I'm losing. So, no, I, I sell it. That would have been a horrible idea. This made me laugh so hard <laughs> when I read it this morning because all I could think about was that cutout scene from The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which was a... Uh, uh, Norman Osborn's head in a you know a cryogenic tank mm. that they didn't have there. He's like, I'm still alive, you know. <laughs> and it makes perfect sense when you hear this uh, thing from Dennis Leary. They're gonna like, it sounds so horrible. Like it's no secret that I thought Amazing Spider-Man Two was garbage. I hated it. <laughs> and um, this just would have been worse. This would have been like you know poo on the top of a cherry on top of a mountain of crap. You know, it would have been like unbelievable. Like just hearing that, I was like, that is so against everything that anything that spider-man you could pick like the jackal did made a clone of of gwen stacy back in the 70s and that was like really weird strange comic book storytelling uh, this just sounds horrible but so. i will say that shep and i are happy to bring dennis leary into our aunt may production yes, uh, yes. yes. spicy larry it's going on the code name <laughs> spicy larry but we've been Starring working on marissa it. tomei yeah there's a lot of people that we've already talked to who are going to be in it's star studded we'd love dennis leary to be involved if you want to be in and we could bring you back to life kill you multiple times in the movie <laughs> And every time you just keep coming back more eroded, sort of like American Werewolf in London. Let's talk. All right, what's next? <laughs> the first new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a surprise hit last year, taking in $485 million worldwide from a $125 million production budget. And the sequel hits theaters in June 2016. One of the new additions to the series, Arrow star Stephen Amell, recently spoke about his character Casey Jones and how we shouldn't expect the same guy from the comics or cartoons. Amell said the following, It's certainly not your father's or your younger self's Casey Jones, but that's because we meet him at a very different time in his development. He is not the Casey Jones that a lot of comic fans have come to know and love. He is a guy with a job that lives in New York and loves hockey. When things go awry and when he goes through the normal methods of what someone would do when they're a law-abiding citizen and he's met with laughter and scorn, he decides to take things into his own hands. John, do you buy or sell Amel's statements? Um, first of all, folks, I'm a huge Stephen Amell fan. I, I I think the guy is great. I don't watch his show anymore because I didn't, I think Arrow went to crap. But but he is amazing, <laughs> and I'm really excited that he's in this film. And if you know anything about him, he himself is a massive hockey fan. If you watch any L.A. Kings game, at some point they'll show him in his in his you know season <laughs> seats, you know, standing there hanging out. And I, I'm really excited he's in this movie. And I buy this. I buy this. When you when you're making an adaptation, I harp on this all the time. Whether it's from based on a book or based on a comic or based on an old TV show or based on anything, do your first priority is do what is best for the movie. Do things that will make your movie a better movie. Your first priority is not be faithful to the original source material. That is not your first priority. And I think if, hey, look, if making Casey Jones exactly the way he was in the comics or the cartoons, or whatever, and there have been different iterations of him in those platforms, by the way, too. If that was what was best for your movie, then you do that. But if you say, you know what, if we have this character, Casey Jones, but we make him do this and this and this, it fits better into our movie overall, then that's what you should do. I love filmmakers taking on their own takes on these characters. So for me, it's a buy. Schnapp? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm so unfamiliar with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like heroes and villains, that, I mean, I saw that image and I was like, he looks cool. If that's what he's, is he going to fight? Does he have superpowers? I have no <laughs> idea. Is he just a dude with a hockey stick? And then he's, is he a good guy or a bad guy? No, he's is a New he Yorker good? with a hockey stick okay. filled with rage. <laughs> Ooh. All right. Then <laughs> I'm going to take the law to his he's own hands, guy. which has happened to people in that predicament in the past. All right. So he teams up with the Turtles. Yep. Yes. Sounds great. I, I mean, initially it. they're kind of like, wait, 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 who are, who is this guy? Right. We should probably beat the crap out of each other. Him and Raphael have a nice little battle in the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film. I know everything about those <laughs> nice. movies. But then they eventually team up. So, like, is he like a like a Punisher or a vigilante? Yeah. Like he's a, yes, yes, that's okay. kind of it. Yes. Awesome. I, I love A it. more PG-rated Punisher. Right. He, yes. He's a Punisher who's <laughs> waiting for his gun license. So in the meantime, <laughs> he just takes a hockey stick. Awesome. Yeah, and, and, and I buy these comments as well because uh, Stephen Amell, I thought, was a great guy to play Casey Jones. Me too. And getting a little bit of insight into the origin story of Casey Jones, it's not going to be the entire movie, but I like that. When I was a little kid, I got the book adaptation of the movie Ninja Turtles, and there's an extra scene in the book that this is 
is back when I read, and it said that <laughs> Casey Jones was in his apartment in New York, and he's watching the news, and he's seeing all these people, oh, this, this, this crime wave and all these robberies, and he got so upset that he put on the hockey mask and went out with a stick and started to beat the crap out of some bad guys. Then he ran into the turtles. But just even seeing that, seeing this guy upset in his apartment about the crime going on outside, that's what I want in this world, and I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. Elias Cotius is still the best Casey Jones of all time. <laughs> I don't think Mel can get to that level, but I hope he can. Elias is awesome. All right, what's next? There has been a lot of talk and speculation about the possible involvement of actor Idris Elba in the upcoming third Star Trek film, Star Trek Beyond. However, the speculation can now end. In a new video put out by the cast on the set of the Starship Enterprise in support of Omaze and nine global charitable organizations where a fan and friend can win a walk-on role in the new film, the crew officially introduced Elba as part of the cast. Schnepp, do you buy or sell Idris Elba joining the cast of Star Trek Beyond? I buy it, but is are, are you going to be the captain of a ship or something? That's they're all pointing towards the captain's chair. It's not a walk-on role. They're like, you're going to be the captain. <laughs> I'd be like, can I please get that? If it's just a walk-on, like you're like you're next to some schlubby alien in the background. Forget it. I totally buy Edris Elba. I think he's great. I love him as an actor. He's fantastic. Luther is an incredible TV series that I that saw him in. I love him as Hemdell. He's everything he's been, and he's been fantastic. I first saw him in The Wire. It's an incredible yep. role. Stringer Bell, fantastic role. That's the, the role that made him, that put him on the map. And he's incredible. He's an amazing addition to anyone who can ever get that guy to be in anything. They've just upped and plussed their whole whatever. So I'm all for it. Yeah, well, I sell the fact that the cast still has to shop at Old Navy, but I buy the fact <laughs> that this guy is going to be in this movie. And now, originally, when we talked about this rumor is that he might play a Klingon, which I thought was really an interesting take mm. and putting his talents to use in a new way if he was a villain or if they ended up teaming up like that. But anytime you get this guy as part of your production, especially in a huge budget franchise like this, which, uh, you know, he was rumored for Bond forever, and maybe he still takes the mantle once Daniel Craig is done. But until that happens, having this guy in your franchise blockbuster is a huge plus for me i'm buying this big time there's there's nothing but buy for this first of all let's bring a little bit of attention to their cause this thing they're doing with omaze if you watch the video it's go to omaze.com and i'm sure you can find the video of it's a very clever put together video with all the cast walking around the starship enterprise and doing all this stuff and then they bring in idris elba and they're all on, on the on the uh the bridge of the enterprise and all of a sudden Disco lights come on and music starts playing. And when the beat drops, Idris Elba drops down the floor, starts break dancing. For it. It's actually pretty good. And it's to support a great cause. I think, you know, you put in 10 bucks and you're entered to win this prize of you and a friend getting a walk on roll. And all the proceeds go to these nine global charities. It's a really great cause. Look it up. Idris Elba. What he what he has going for him right now is I don't know that anybody brings a more powerful presence to the screen just when they walk on it than Idris does. And you p pointed out The Wire and all these other things. Even when he was in comedies like The Office. Remember he was on like two seasons of The Office? Was he? Yeah, where he was like the new boss of The Office when Michael mm. left. Uh, for a short time, Michael left, and he was the new boss. He was hilarious in this. I love this little film that he did with Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who was the comedian in Watchmen, uh, and of, more importantly, he was in Supernatural, um, <laughs> and uh, Chris Evans called The Losers. The, nobody watched oh, that great. movie, and I really liked yeah. The Loser. And he was actually in it with, um, uh, uh, oh, why am, I, why am I drawing blank on her name? Um, uh, Zoe Saldana. Thank you very much. Zoe Saldana was I, also in that film. I do. I remember yeah. that movie. Yes, that movie's I, cool. Yeah. I like that movie. I think it's really underrated. So this is just, this is all by, all the way. I think this is a terrific idea. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag. And today's Mailbag segment is brought to you by our good friends over at AMC Theaters. Listen, if you guys have a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions and let's see if we can get it on the show. So for now, Sinead, what's in the mailbag? Grady writes, as we know, it's been well over a year since Peter Billingsley wrapped production on the Term Life film. Do you feel that there are production issues in the pipes or do you feel a brief gap between the trailer release and the movie hitting theaters, with it supposedly having a 2015 release date. Being an extra in this film, I'm totally stoked for this project to drop. Yeah, I, as far as I know, I'm concerned, though. I am concerned, because as far as I know, it's still supposed to come out this year. But as of right now, I do not believe it has an official release date. It's just kind of says 2015. I fear a little bit that this may go the same way of Stretch. Mm. Um, yes. And you know, remember that where Stretch was supposed to come out, that Chris Pine movie? 
was supposed to come out and, and then I, you know, just kind of meandered around and all of a sudden it was a VOD thing. And I fear that, but as far as I know, the plan's still there. If you don't know anything about this thing, Term Life, it's a really cool idea. Vince Vaughn, and I think it's, I don't think it's a comedy either. I think it's supposed to be more serious. Vince Vaughn has an estranged daughter and he wants the one good thing in his life that he wants to do. He wants to do one good thing in his life. So he takes out a life insurance policy on himself and makes his estranged daughter the beneficiary. The problem is there's a contract out on his life that's so big that every hitman in the city is trying to kill him. And his life insurance policy doesn't become vested or doesn't kick in for another 24 hours. So the movie is basically about him needing to survive just 24 more hours, stay alive, so that his daughter can get the life insurance. I think it's a great idea. I love to see Vince Vaughn in this type of role after seeing what he's been doing on the new True Detective. Um, so as far as I know, it's still coming. But like you, I am worried. Mark, have you heard anything about it? You know, the the premise that you just described sounds like it could be multiple things. It might be very dramatic and dark. It might be a dark comedy. Yeah. And that could be the reason why the release date feels like it might be postponed is because the studio is saying, no, this needs to be lighter. This needs to be funnier. We, we need a different ending to this. Vince Vaughn usually has movies come out around Thanksgiving, which is the time families all want to go together, like The Delivery Man or something like that. So maybe they were trying to position it as that, and then they, they screen the film. Film and it doesn't quite hit that demographic they're hoping for, so it gets pushed a little bit. But I'd like to see this. It sounds like a cool idea and a new step for Vince Vaughn. Also of Haley Steinfeld and Peter Billingsley. He was Ralphie from A Christmas Story. How do you not root for that guy? Get your movie out. It sounds like a VOD release to me. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, not that. I, it sounds like that's what they're going for. I'd yeah. like to see it in the theater as well, but that there's no. There's nothing. Even the trailer got taken down, basically, is what we were talking about. Yeah, I, I couldn't find it anywhere, actually. Um, yeah. yeah, it just sounds like they're like, all right, if we don't hear about it in the next two months, it's not going to be coming out for Christmas. So maybe they're, they're just pushing it to January or February as a release. You know, It's hard to tell, but I don't think it's going to come out in 2015. Do us a favor, guys. If you know anything about if you've heard any other information, or have some links to share, jump in the comment section and share them because uh, we would love to know. All right, Sinead, what's next? Andy writes, hey, guys, I was just wondering if you could clarify something for me. With the recent announcement that Phil Lord and Chris Miller will be directing the Star Wars anthology Han Solo spinoff, do you think that they will be still do you think that he will still be attached to the Flash in the animated Spider-Man movies? Both of these movies are scheduled for 2018, which would be when the next Star Wars anthology mm -hmm. movie after Rogue one would be due, although there is no confirmed date for the Han Solo movie. Um, well, it's, it's important to point out here that while there's been speculation and, and conjecture, Miller and Lord were never announced as director for those other films. They were never said, nobody ever said they were going to be directing the Spider-Man animated feature. Nobody ever said they were going to be directing anything else. They are directing the Star Wars anthology film. We know that. Still, whether the writing and producing, that is time consuming and that does seem like a lot to be on their plate to play any sort of significant role, which is what we heard. As far as I know up until this point, they are still attached to everything, but I won't be surprised at all if within the next four to five weeks, we hear that they had to step off of something. I don't know, Schnepp, have you heard anything else or how do you think this is going to play out? I haven't heard anything, but yeah, it does seem like a lot of, uh, of big tentpole movies to be involved in that are all happening at the same time. So splitting your, I see them holding on to two out of those three. <clears throat> And probably mm. they'll they'll drop the Flash because it seems like Spider Man being in the Marvel universe, being in the Disney universe, crossover Star Wars works a little bit better for everybody. You know, it's almost in the same camp. And DC, Mar you know, Flash is the opposite spectrum. So I would say, you know, if anything, they could hold on to like EP credits for the Flash and oversee it. Maybe they already have a first draft, or they they could have pounded out a script and be like, bam, that's it. You know, yeah. we'll polish it up. You know. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, is that even if they don't totally step off the project, if it is like uh, we're just going to step back and oversee it and basically slap our name on this right. and get the get all the residual dough that we get for being a part of this project technically, and maybe they, they oversee, they look at drafts of scripts, or maybe you're right, John, maybe they already had a draft in place. They're like, here you go, you punch it up and go make your stuff, but their focus is definitely going to be on directing the next Star Wars anthology. Speaking of The Flash, did you notice The Flash in Trainwreck? We, we saw Trainwreck last night. Did you notice The Flash in Train wreck. I noticed the flash in train wreck. He's the intern. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the flash. Oh, wow. That's DC's Ezra new Yeah, that was wow. Ezra Miller. All right. Way to go, kid. <laughs> All right, what's <laughs> next? 
Ali writes, hey, Collider Crew, how's everything going? Thank you for your hard work and making our lives much better. <laughs> My question is, what are some of your favorite Hans Zimmer scores? I love the work he did on Man, on Man of Steel, the Dark Knight trilogy, 12 Years a Slave, and Inception. He's my favorite composer alongside John Williams. Thanks and keep up the amazing work. This might be a little bit of because you did it lately-ism, but I, th I thought the score to Man of Steel was insanely good. When, yeah. when you watch, it, it's... What you can judge a score by two different types of criteria. One criteria is just sitting in your car and popping in the CD and listening to it. And it's the Man of Steel soundtrack is very good that way. But another way you measure it is how does it enhance the scenes in which the music is playing? And when you watch Man of Steel, a movie which I loved, when you watch Man of Steel, the music adds it, it, it is such a dimension to the image on the screen, it plays so perfectly into it. I, for, yeah, so for right now, I got to say the score to Man of Steel for me personally. I, I just, I, I, it's magic to me. Anyway, Mark, what about you? Favorite Howard Zimmer? When, he's one of these composers that can have uh, something that will enhance an already good film, like with, with what he did with Crimson Tide is a movie mm. that I caught on TNT the other day, and I'm like, yeah, this score is great. And then also, it can, it can kind of apologize for some silly scenes in movies, like what he did with The Rock, when they have that useless car chase on the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> We're having so much fun because that score gets you so pumped up. So, <laughs> And I love The Rock, by the way, but come on, that car chase did not belong in there. Hans Zimmer saw it didn't belong in there and was like, you know what? Watch this. And he threw some composer <laughs> magic in there. <laughs> Snap. <clears throat> I'm going to say The Dark Knight. Uh, I love that score. And I love how he, the, especially the Joker's theme, the way he just like put together all different kinds of sound effects of like needles dropping and metal scraping. And mm. I mean, he really, really worked his magic. I also love Man of Steel too. He's a, an interstellar. I mean, every, almost every thing. And Inception too, right? Yeah. yeah. All, all of his scores are great. He really puts a puts a, a lot. By the down. way, you spoke too soon about resisting the nerd flu. I think I, I can, know. I, it's I like, can hear. It's I like can hear. No, no, no. Getting worse. In I just, I just, just, just somebody, somebody be like, "Yo, fat man, drink some water." I have to. All right. <laughs> He's just getting emotional. You know, the Dark Knight yeah. score does different things. It, it got me all people. teared up. I would say Amazing Spider-Man Two, not as great. I was like, a, if I was gonna stack, you know, I gotta. Hey, kids, I gotta always rip on it. Give me a shot. So he's gonna be me ripping on it. Uh, it'd be like of his entire au revoir. It'd be like at the bottom. Somewhere in the bottom, like, hey, I just started out, and then I decided to do this. Like, along came a spider, scrimpy, scrimpy. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, folks, that will do it for us for this edition of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, there are lots of great movies playing over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Stay up to date on all the great stuff that we're putting out. Tomorrow, there's a brand new Jedi Council going to be dropping. Heroes dropped last night, which was a great one. Uh, so just stay up to date on everything we're doing. Don't forget, guys, you can also follow us on Twitter just at Collider. Collider Video and follow us on Instagram as well at Collider Video. And for some reason, Christian Harloff is back there. I'm sure he's, he's periscoping, periscoping right now. The he's damn periscoping. the guy can't just can't get off that. I yeah. want to thank the people sitting at the table with me, sitting over here to our left, the soon-to-be deadly infectious person, John Schnepp. <laughs> Schnepp, where can people find I'm you online? I'm avoiding the con crowd. <laughs> you can find me on my last few days before I'm bedridden uh, at Instagram and Twitter at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Once again, you could buy my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Go to www www.tdoslwh.com digital download blu-ray dvd we're shipping at the end of this week we've got everything in so it's all going out to you guys sitting over here mr mark ellis mark where can people find you i'll be tweeting my new and updated thoughts on every subsequent viewing of the joy trailer will i see more in it let's find out together twitter and instagram at 5150 ellis tour dates for the fall coming out this friday kansas city syracuse atlanta get ready the nerd flu is coming your way <laughs> Our lovely host today, the unshakable Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you online? Um, well, I'll be staying the heck away from John Schnepp, that's for sure. <coughs> yeah, no, it's not happening. And also, I'm online, Twitter, Instagram, everything else, at Sinead DeFries and at that so Sinead.com. And uh, you can follow me on uh, f uh, Twitter and Facebook, YouTube, whatever, just at John Campia. Special thanks to the guys in the room. We got Dennis Zen, we got Wendy Lee, we got Ray Ora back there. And thank you to you guys so much for joining us. Don't forget, most important part of the show is not what we have to say. It's what you have to say. Jump down to the comments section and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. That'll do it for us, guys. My name's John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye.